Welcome to CoLab 101. We run this program at the Capital CoLab a couple times a year. And it's for both our current partners and people who have maybe heard about CoLab and are wondering what we're all about. Our goals are really to introduce you to the full body of our work today, to make sure that you know who the team is that's keeping CoLab running, and then also give you some opportunity to ask questions and um, to make sure that that you have a little bit of interaction with us. So before we get going here, if you wouldn't mind just as, as we're getting started, dropping in the chat your name, your organization, one thing you hope we'll cover today. And what we'll do then at the back end is just make sure that we've gone through those points and answered all your questions. We're pretty good at keeping tabs on that, but um, would really like to make sure you're getting value add from this time together. And also would just like to know who's actually here. So please go ahead and drop that in the chat so we can, some of you I know, and I'm perfectly comfortable calling out, which anyone who's ever been on a Zoom with me knows that. Um, Hi, Kent. Welcome. Oh, well, welcome to town. Um, yes, we know University of Phoenix well. So really eager to share our work with you. Thank you for being here. Anyone else, if you want to keep it, if you want to play it cool, that's totally fine. Hey there, Janae, Janae right? And I, I know you corrected me the one time. Um, really nice to have you here. T. Rowe is one of our great partners and um, delighted to tell you the, the founding story of CoLab. And Frank, we will definitely fill you in on the programs. So hello, April. Oh yes, Hood College. We're looking forward to talking to your president later this week. So really glad to have you there. Tasha. Tasha knows. Um, she probably was the number one person that I called out on a call a while back. So I'm um, sorry, Tasha, again, but except that you rolled with it. You were great. Um, I do believe in the cold calling. I was not a law school professor, but I, um, you know, it's DC. So everyone, you loved it. Thanks, Tasha. I'm glad, I'm glad you did. I felt a little bad after the moment. I was like, uh-oh. Um, Amanda, great to have you here. Thank you for joining from the University of Maryland. I'm a Turk myself, did my doctorate out at College Park. So I'm always happy to have you here. And more University of Maryland too with David. Great, thank you. Well, folks, keep it coming. Feel free to introduce yourselves um, and we'll get into the meat. So we'll have about 30 minutes of presentation and then we'll have uh, the rest of the time for questions. And throughout the process, if you have questions, if you have comments and you wanna drop them in the chat, um, feel free to do so. And we'll try and monitor that and, and make sure that we answer your questions along the way. So let's go ahead and get to the next slide. Jeanette, right, I knew, yeah, I thought so. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, so what I'm gonna do first is tell you a little bit of the origin story of the Capital CoLab and, and where we came from. Um, this is one of my favorite stories actually about this, about this area. And I think speaks to the many of the reasons that all of us choose to work at the Greater Washington Partnership and at the Capital CoLab. A number of years ago, uh, there was a group of CEOs in the region that were trying to go after the Olympics 2024 bid. And in the course of that bid, they realized that if they pitched Baltimore or Richmond or DC as the city for the Olympics, they wouldn't get it. Um, but that if they looked at this as a mega region, they would in fact be a much more competitive contender for the Olympics. Now, uh, we of course didn't end up getting the Olympics for 2024. I think many of us would say that's probably okay given the state of the world. Um, but what came out of that was a realization that by thinking, instead of thinking, um, very jurisdictionally, which often happens in this region and which often leads to a great deal of competition. There was tremendous value in actually thinking about us as this mega region with all of the resources that a mega region has. And so out of that process, the Greater Washington Partnership was born. That was in 2016 or early, very, I think technically incorporated in 2017. So the collab came soon after, and it came because a number of our CEOs were beginning to engage in saying, we, we really are concerned about our future workforce. What should we do about it? So they convened a number of university presidents. So everyone came together and had a very productive conversation and rapidly agreed that where they wanted to focus was digital tech talent. And if you go to the next slide for me, Lois, the reason for this is because our region actually has a tremendously well-educated, as you all know, tremendously well-educated population, uh, but it's not necessarily consistent across 
the, the entire region from, from zip code to zip code. And it also still isn't producing enough talent in digital tech to actually fill all of the open positions in digital tech roles in this region. So digital tech was one of those things where everyone said, you know what, if we, if we can figure out how to, how to um, build this pipeline, we're gonna be in a much better spot. And if we can figure out how to do it equ equitably by bringing in stakeholders from all across the region that are really focused on bringing all populations through and into this workforce, then we're actually going to be much more ahead of the curve. So the collab then, and if you go to the next slide for me, Lois, the collab was born of that conversation a little less than three years ago, and it is focused on building the region's diverse digital tech workforce. We have an advisory committee that runs our that that oversees and gives guidance to all of our efforts. And this advisory committee is led by our employers. So you'll hear a lot today during our, our conversation about our employer led efforts. And that's because we really believe that one of the primary issues that we are addressing with the collab is the miscommunication and sometimes the lack of clear communication between the education side of the house and the employer side of the house. So at our core, what we're focused on is making sure that as educators across the region are striving to build this workforce that we know we so desperately need, they're getting the clear signals and they're getting the clear engagement with employers that they need for their students, for their faculty, and for their leaders across, across their institutions. So our advisory committee then is led by our very own Wes Bush, who many of you will know was uh, formerly CEO and chairman of Northrop Grumman. He now spends an awful lot of his time helping to guide our work and we're tremendously grateful to that. Um, but we also have an incredible group of other leaders from uh, a number of our collab partner organizations that participate in this advisory committee regularly. If we look at the next slide, then you'll see our full list of employers, um, with the exception of one. And so this is a funny, a funny story, I think. Um, and we'll see if my team starts laughing because they know they know where I'm going. The CIA is also one of our partners. Now, the, the thing about the CIA is they don't like to leave an electronic trail. And so we aren't allowed to use their logo, uh, but we are allowed to talk about them. And so their logo, I know, right? It's funny, Eric, I think it's funny. And I love the CIA. I think what they're doing is incredible work, I think, I mean, I don't actually know, um, but I'm told it's incredible work. And, and what we do know is that they are hiring a digital tech workforce. We also know that part of this region's competitive advantage is around having government um, engaged in this conversation. So when we think about the largest employers, we need to be engaging government groups as well. So the CIA was our first federal agency that came to the table and we're in conversations with a number of others to bring those to bring those other large employer voices from the from the government side into the work. So if we go to the next slide then, what are we all about? And I just wanted to share our vision, mission, and the key outcomes that we're driving toward. So we really, our vision is to build the most diverse digital tech workforce in the country. And we have, we actually have a little bit of an advantage here because the population in our region is very, very diverse. And so it's not like we actually have to import diverse talent to get here. We just need to be sure that they're given the opportunities and given the pathways to get into the digital tech workforce. So we think we can do it. We think we have a real opportunity. We know that compared to many other digital tech hubs, we're actually already ahead of the game. We're just not doing well enough yet. So this is really part of our vision. Our mission then is really to work by partnering with employers and educators to build these industry aligned digital tech pathways. And so what this means is that nothing happens in a vacuum that we're constantly reaching out to employers and reaching out to educators to ensure that they're in dialogue with each other and to ensure, you'll hear from Lindsay in a little bit, to ensure that everyone is clear with our what our employer signaling system is all about and has a source for truth when it comes to what they offer around digital tech talent. So here's what we've promised to the region. It's that by 2025, we will engage over 45,000 students and adult learners in digital tech pathways. And, and this is really key for us, at least 50% of those people that we engage will be from underrepresented populations. So we hold ourselves accountable using data and metrics. We report out monthly to all of our partners and I will be the first to tell you we're not there yet. But we report out monthly, we bring in partners who are committed to these same goals and I believe we will get there by 2025. So that third outcome then becomes really key, which is we wanna double the number of partner organizations working to scale collab initiatives. And that's because we believe that it's going to take all of us to solve many of these persistent challenges that have been present in, in our region. 
um, we also believe these are really sticky problems. And, and so it's not like they're easy to solve. They're quite challenging to solve. And we're going to need partners from across the region that have different ideas, that have new ideas, that have old ideas and an interest in scaling. And we need to bring them together so that we can build towards these key outcomes. So if we go to the next slide then, I do want to share a little bit about our values. And, and this is really key. We uh, have spent a bit of time a year ago making sure that we were crystal clear on this and we refer to them quite regularly just to make sure that we're guiding all of our efforts appropriately. So first and foremost is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So as I said, we use data to hold ourselves and the region accountable for our diversity goals. So that means we are completely transparent about them. And, and we will talk at length, we send them out publicly um, and, and we believe in setting bold targets and, and being clear about them. We also are making sure that we are engaging diverse partners. This means when we hire consultants and vendors to come to the table, that they are consultants and vendors who will push us to really, again, hold ourselves accountable for our diversity goals, who will remind us um, that you, know, you said that equity was important and here's what an equity lens looks like. And, and this, is, this is really key for us. Um, we also want to make sure, obviously, that we're partnering with institutions that work directly with diverse students. And, and so that means working kind of across the spectrum with HBCUs, with other minority serving institutions, but also with work-based learning populations that have unique expertise in engaging with diverse students. Uh, you know, we don't need to recreate the wheel, we need to leverage the wheel. And so if we're seeing organizations that are doing really good work, it's our job to augment it and to bring it into the conversation and make sure other people know about it. And then we are embedding diversity and inclusion into all of our programs. And this includes sending resources to diverse students, building programs that are intentionally targeting diverse students, including a program that we hope will be launched later this year called the CoLab Fellows Program, which is intended to bring diverse talent into building the cybersecurity workforce of the future. So this would bring diverse employees into contact with faculty and, and other university leaders to help engage in curriculum building, to help engage in work-based learning and project-based learning activities, and really to be an employer resource focused on cybersecurity that is, that is really looking at cybersecurity with an equity lens. So that's, that's really the first value that I just wanted to share with you because it underpins so much of our work. And then the second one is data and research. And so this is really about, again, making sure we are as transparent as we can be and that we're measuring ourselves regularly so that we can pivot and adjust as we need to. We're under three years old, which means we're still figuring some of this out. And so we use data to make sure that we understand when we're heading in the right direction towards our goals and potentially when there's, when there's um, shifts that need to be made. And this allows us to have a really transparent conversation about it um, and ensure, again, that we make those pivots and transitions where we need. So you'll hear from Lindsay in just a minute about our employer signaling system and that feedback loop. We also engage regularly with all of our collab partners. And so this means constant, constant outreach, constant meetings, a real cadence of, of interaction just to ensure that they're hearing what we're up to and they're giving us regular feedback. It's very much a working partnership. Uh, and so I often will say this is like the hardest amount of work you'll ever do for your volunteer work, um, but it's, it's, quite in, it's quite intense for our partners. Uh, and then we have our program metrics. So this is what I was saying, we regularly report out and we do at the end of the year, an annual report that um, shows our impact on the region. So quickly, and then we'll get into introductions of the entire team and I will stop talking at you and the others will start talking at you. I do wanna share our timeline of collab growth, just to give you an idea of really the exponential momentum that we've been able to develop. And this is, I, we get questioned a lot. Yes. From, What's a... Uh... We, so, yeah. Oh, Sean was not talking to us. Okay, uh, Sean, if you want to ask a question, you are welcome to, and um, anyone else, feel free to type in the chat. So the timeline of collab growth here, I think we get, so we get asked regularly from around the region and around the country, you know, why has collab been able to grow so quickly? And there are some unique factors that really have allowed us to uh, I would say build a foundation and begin implementing very, very quickly in a way that sometimes other opportunities and other, other partnerships from around the country haven't been able to. And first and foremost is just the leadership that we've had at the table. So the fact that the largest CEOs in the region have really stepped up and said, this is important. And they reach out to their colleagues with our education partners 
and say, hey guys, this really is important. Now let's now let's solve this problem. So that's kind of first and foremost as we continue to have executive leadership engaged really consistently throughout the collab. Another reason that we've just been, I think, tremendously um, successful in getting moving so quickly is that we've been resourced. And so when you look at when you look at this timeline, you can see in Q1 of 2019, we were awarded $6 million from JP Morgan Chase and Bloomberg, Bloomberg Philanthropies followed up um, a, a little while later with an additional 1.5 million. And so that really has allowed us, and you'll hear from Rob uh, in a bit, it's allowed us to really grow aggressively our employer signaling system mechanisms and the pieces around work-based learning um, that are tied to all of our K-12 pathways work. Uh, we also have had some tremendous uh, engagement with partners around the region, like the Business Higher Education Forum, which was able to give us a little shot in the arm with some NSF funding. And then finally, I think what's been really exciting is just how energized our education partners are about this. And so we have that 45,000 target that we're going to hit uh, with the 50% from underrepresented backgrounds. And it's a, it's a big target, but we have 19 universities at the table right now. And we have five K-12 jurisdictions. And so, yes, it's a big target. And I think we're going to hit it. And I think we're going to exceed it. Because what we do is we build the scaled system that ensures that everyone's getting the information and the resources they need in order to be able to build their digital tech pathways. So with that, I uh, do want to pause for a minute and introduce you to the CoLab team. So as I said, I'm Jeannie Contardo. I'm the Vice President and Managing Director of the CoLab, um, and I have the privilege of helping to guide this team and having them guide me as we are, are building this audacious vision for the future in the region. Um, and we're just gonna go along along the row here in, in terms of the pictures. So Deb, if you would kick it off next and introduce yourself. Sure, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Deb Hodge, I'm Director of Programs. Um, I work mainly with our Digital Tech Credential Program, which aligns our employer identified knowledge, skills, and abilities to coursework at our regional university partners. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Hi, I'm Robert Owens, Director of Workforce Initiatives. My portfolio consists of the Talent Ready Initiative, uh, which Jeannie talked about, which comprises the K-12 jurisdictions. I will also oversee the work-based learning program and strategy that the CoLab is taking on. Hi, I'm Lindsay Johnson. I'm the Manager of Programs and Insights for the CoLab team, and I oversee our employer signaling system and any talent and skills thought leadership. I'm the person to reach out to if you're interested in joining us as an industry advisor or if you want to get on our monthly newsletter. Hi, I'm Tom, uh, the Senior Associate for Operations and Strategy at the CoLab. Uh, my portfolio largely consists of managing our systems and just generally supporting project management across our different initiatives. Hi, everyone. Tasha Washington, the Student Engagement Associate here at the CoLab. So I handle student communications and engagements, as well as oversee our campus ambassador program with our institutions. Hi, I'm Lois. I'm a program assistant for the CoLab team. I help uh, manage all of our large scale events with our partners, and I also help with the digital tech credential program. Terrific. And you can't see her on the screen, I don't think. Oh, she's under there under GWP. But Jenna Klein is like the unofficial collab member. She's the events manager for the Greater Washington Partnership. Show your face, Jenna, so we can love on you. That's Jenna. She keeps the wheels moving when it comes to events. And, and we value her very much, even though she owes her primary allegiance to the partnership and not to the collab specifically. But uh, she's an amazing team member. So thank you, Jenna. Anything you want to add? No, just excited to be here. Um, I'm already learning some things I didn't know about the collab, so this is a great refresher for myself as well. <laughs> Maybe we should make sure the whole partnership gets on this one next time. So that's that's the team, and and what you'll see is we work really closely together in some ways, despite the fact that we're all working out of our homes right now. COVID is allowing us to work even more closely than ever um, because we're in constant communication with each other and really moving work forward very very quickly. What I'm going to do now is hand it over to Lindsay, who's going to walk through a little bit of the framing for the work that we do and more detail on our employer signaling system. So Lindsay, if you would take it away and continue. If you have questions, you can drop them in the chat and I'll either answer them in the chat or we'll answer them when we have a break. Thanks, Jeannie. And some of you may have already seen a lot of the data that's on the slide in front of you right now, but we figured we'd show it just to 
just to give you a sense of how important digital tech is to our region and then link a report for your future reference if you want to learn a little bit more about how we're positioned for digital tech and tech adjacent opportunities in the future. Um, but as Jeannie mentioned, when the employers um, that are part of the COLA first came together in 2018, they all agreed across the board and across industries that digital tech skills were really critical for entry-level jobs and they really needed some a bigger talent pool to recruit candidates from. And that's where we started our work. And the thing too is that the labor market information supports that. Um, Jeannie mentioned we really care about data as a guiding piece of our work and the analysis that's linked here gets into that. The takeaway is that by 2025, there's an estimated 17,000 or so digital tech roles that will go unfilled and about 42,000 tech adjacent roles that will go unfilled unless we do some work together as a whole ecosystem um, across employers, educators, and students to make sure we're preparing the workforce of the future. What you don't see on the slide, but you will see in the report, is some more information about the demographic disparities within tech, which is not a surprise looking nationwide. And though we're better positioned than a lot of our peer regions in terms of our tech diversity, there's still huge underrepresentation in the field. About 17% of the digital tech workforce is Black and African American, and only 5% is um, Hispanic and Latinx workers. Right now, coming into 2021, we have about 31% of our engaged students coming from underrepresented groups. So that is a huge piece that we're moving from as a foundation um, throughout our 2021 work. If you go to the next slide, we delve a little bit more into what our impact was in 2020 and how some of the work that Jeannie talked about guided that. The key thing again here is that in 2020, about a year ago, we committed to engaging 45,000 students and adult learners in our digital tech pathways by 2025 and wanted to make sure that at least 50% of them are coming, coming from underrepresented populations. Looking ahead to 2021, if you can go to the next slide, Lois, we have a series of goals to support some of those strategies that Jeannie has talked about and that we've seen on the slide so far. And broadly, our goals are set to ensure that the skills that are most critical for in-demand jobs in digital tech and tech adjacent jobs across our region are communicated in a way that's easy for our educators to tailor curriculum and in a way that's easy for students to take the courses that they need or change direction even if that's what's important to them. And we also set these goals to ensure that equity remains front and center and that we also have the appropriate systems in place, which is what um, Tom kind of talked about in his intro. Um, there are a lot of behind the scenes operations that have to happen such as um, implementing a digital badge and setting our metrics to make sure, make sure that we stick to the outcomes that we've set for ourselves. So that's a big piece that is a little under the radar, but so critical to the foundation of what we do and something that we're amping up further in 2021. Um, if you go to the next slide, this captures what our ultimate goal is in terms of communicating employer needs to our partners in the region. And that's through the employer signaling system. If you can skip to the next slide, Lois, we walk through all of the steps that are in, oop, one before that. Thanks. We walk through all the steps that play into this employer signaling system and how it works every year. High level, it works as a feedback loop, starting with employers where they communicate their skills needs in digital tech and tech adjacent roles um, in the form of knowledge, skills, and abilities, which we call KSAs. And we make sure that those are articulated in a way that are granular enough and with the appropriate level of knowledge, skill, or ability indicated so educators know how to tie them into curriculum in a way that makes sense for their institution. And that's something we really like as we think about impacting the talent pipeline at scale is that our education partners from the get-go, we always wanted to make sure they had the flexibility to implement these in-demand skills in a way that made the most sense for their institution. And that ultimately goes into feed um, what students are learning in the classroom. We support that through professional experiences such as work-based learning opportunities or project-based learning to make sure that they're even more prepared for entry-level roles. And then we take that feedback from employers um, to get a sense of what's missing, what, what more can students come prepared with, and then build that into our work for the following year. Um, jumping to the next slide. The first thing that happens at the start of every calendar year to help with this employer signaling system is our KSA refresh process. 
I mentioned that I'm the point of contact for any industry advisors who are interested in making sure that the, the priority digital tech skills for entry level roles are communicated. Um, and the best way to do that is by signing up as an industry advisor to help with our KSA refresh. And the KSAs again are not only important because they feed curriculum, but because they're a way to guide us as we think about research to shape the hearts and minds of anyone interested in talent and skills in the region. Um, and then just for overall program improvement. So if you or some of your colleagues are a subject matter expert at any of the working groups listed in the center of the slide, this is a, a really good opportunity to directly impact what students in the region are learning and make sure that the needs of your organization's entry level digital tech and tech and Jason roles are heard. Um, so again, feel free to reach out to me with any questions. I'm happy to walk you through. I'll be recruiting folks throughout the month of February for our March refresh this year. Um, with that, I will kick it over to Deb who can talk a little bit more about our programs. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I work um, on the CoLab's Digital Tech Credential Initiative, um, which is one of our two signature programs that you see on the screen. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Lois, um, in addition to the employer partners that you saw earlier in the presentation, we also collaborate with these 19 regional universities on identifying pathways that align to the KSAs that Lindsay just mentioned. So far, 15 of these 19 universities have identified at least one pathway that leads to a digital tech credential. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, I'll highlight the different versions of the credential that can be offered at any particular institution. Um, so you'll see on the screen here, we have four different versions. Um, each of these has its own set of unique KSAs. So the generalist credential is really focused on those non-technical roles and the KSAs cover basic digital literacy, data analysis, and, and anything that you would really need for a non-technical entry-level role. Um, we also have three different specializations for the specialist credential, and these are really a deep dive into the KSAs in either cybersecurity, machine learning, or data analytics. Um, these really target um, specific technical occupations and roles, and they often align to uh, majors at a university, most often STEM majors. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, this will illustrate some example pathways from our universities that have been developed for the generalist credential. Um, you'll see in some cases, it's just a set of courses, or it could map to a certificate program, um, or e and even some cases, we have an official minor within the university that maps to the KSAs. The really nice thing is that the universities can customize their pathway for their specific student audience and also embed them into pathways that really make sense and align with the mission of their institution. So we provide the KSAs, as Lindsay mentioned, and the universities do the hard work of mapping into existing or even creating, in some cases, new curricula to align. Um, so the next slide um, really highlights the digital badge. So once a student completes their pathway through their respective university, they earn a co-branded digital badge. You'll see an example here on the screen from Marymount University. And the nice thing about this badge is that it allows learners to tangibly demonstrate the skills they've earned. Um, so it's more than just a transcript that lists out the courses. Um, it, it actually has some data behind it that will allow um, employers to identify the students through their recruiting processes and really look at the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they've deemed necessary for their workforce. Um, so if we go to the next and last slide, I'll, I'll touch on um, highlights our, some of our engagement opportunities. So the programming that we offer gives employers a chance to connect with students earlier in their studies. So it's not just once they've graduated and, and earned all of the KSAs and, and the rest of the um, university curriculum. So the example on the screen is our yearly credential month, which is held every April. Um, the theme for this year is how to maximize your digital tech credential. And we're still in the process of putting together the programming for the month. Um, as we do for all of our programming, we make sure we solicit student feedback and engage our various campus and employer stakeholders um, on what would be useful for them, and also to ensure we're not duplicating anything that's already happening either on our university campuses or through our employers. 
Um, another example of programming is our career fair that we hold every September. Um, we held our first ever this past September 2020. It was a smashing success, so we're, we plan to offer it again this fall. Um, and you know, really open and interested in offering any kinds of programming open to different ideas that you may have about programming that would really benefit students and employers. Um, so I know we're gonna leave some time at the end for questions. So I will now hand it over to my colleague, Robert, who will talk to us a little bit about the K-12 Pathways Initiative. Thanks, Deb. So the K-12 Pathways Initiative, also known as Talent Ready, is an exciting program that we have where we are aware that we need to start career exploration awareness early on. We are committed to making sure that we not only have a diverse population of students who are credentialed and really knowledgeable in the digital pathways, but that we are ensuring that they're starting off early so they can have that awareness, they can have that exposure in high school. So by the time they get to college, they kind of already have an idea of what they want to do. So we're providing several offerings to them. So we go to the next slide. As Jeannie was saying earlier, Talent Ready is really being funded by J.P. Morgan Chase and Bloomberg. And we have five jurisdictions who are part of this initiative. As you see on your screen now, Baltimore City, Fairfax, Montgomery, Prince George's, and D.C. Now, these five jurisdictions, we start in high school, and also these jurisdictions also connect with a community college and a four-year institution. The idea and the concept is really to provide, again, several off-reps that align to the KSAs that Lindsay talked about, so that as students progress throughout their educational journey, they'll be able to be aware of the different, different kind of pathways in IT like cybersecurity, like software development, like networking. So for example, if you look at Montgomery, they have a partnership with Montgomery Community College. Prince George's have Prince George's Community College and Bowie. So again, we wanna make sure that we provide several off-ramps to these students. So as they're progressing, they'll be able to go to a community college if it's their choice or for the institution. And again, we must make sure that we are aware that up to 50% of our populations are gonna be coming from the upper, underrepresented communities. Next slide, please. So as part of the Talent Ready, we also have another type of program that we're working on, which is work-based learning. Again, when you talk about career readiness, especially now in the K-12 arena space, you also wanna make sure that you have an outlet for students to actually get that hands-on experience. So there are several different ways that we engage with our employer partners to really make sure that these students from K-12 to the four institutions are giving these opportunities to really put practice into play, to really learn why they earn in some cases. So again, the support that we get from employers could be career fairs, mock interviews, as Deb said, we do have career fairs where students are able to engage with potential employers, with potential institutions, but we also really invite our employers to come to the table to really allow students to hear from them, like these industry leaders. What did you take to get there? What kind of recommendations would you offer a student like myself? So again, as you see, we have the awareness, we have exposure, we have engagement and immersion. So there are different ways that we are engaging with the community, because we realize that it takes a community, it takes a village, as the old saying goes, to make sure that we are providing these opportunities to our students to make sure that not only they're getting the academia side of it, but they're also getting real world experience. And again, our employers could really, really support in very ways that they have that has been very successful. Next slide, please. So as we look at our strategy here at the CoLab, we have three areas that we focus on, on infrastructure. We meet every month with a group of talent acquisition leaders to really understand how we can make sure that we as a community are coming together to have more diverse recruitments and what steps we could take to make sure that we're not just limited to certain groups, but that we're making this an inclusive environment as well as for its diversity. So we have monthly meetings with a group of talent acquisition leaders from across the Capital Collab. As Lindsay said, we send out newsletters that she sends out to individuals just to keep you informed of all of the great work that we're doing here at the Collab and to also invite you to opportunities that we have that you could be engaged and involved as well. We also have the CoLab membership education, which are ad hoc events that come on uh, sometime monthly, quarterly. 
And then we have the Career Center Working Group that DAB really facilitates with our institutions. As it relates to signature event, we realize that we really must be engaged with our stakeholders. And that's from yourself, institutions, employers, and also our students. So we have several different signature events uh, that again, we will love you all to participate in as well as to engage with one another. We have Credential Month, we have a K-12 Digital Tech Career Exploration, and also we have the Virtual Career Fair. So we do have several different engagement uh, and stakeholder facing events that we have each year that are a signature that we know we are making sure that our stakeholders are involved in the success of our students. And lastly, expanding work-based learning uh, opportunities. So as you see, there are traditional internships, there's micro internships, uh, there's project-based learning, there's work-based learning, and there are apprenticeships. Again, it varies by company, but we do have several different uh, outreaching activities and engagements for work-based learning that we can work with with our employers as it relates to some K-12, if employers go down to that space or to the higher education institution for them to really work with employers to give these firsthand experience for our students. Next slide, please. So here's the exciting part, you know, why get involved, how to get involved. We are always open to really making sure that we are inviting you all to really be part of this great work that we're doing here at the CoLab. So from the student standpoint, we have applied learning opportunities. Uh, as you see, I don't wanna read because I wanna be mindful of the time, but as you see for students, we have applied learning opportunities. We have priority for hiring. We have better paying jobs for students. For businesses, workforce, uh, workforce uh, capability and capacity, excuse me, uh, as well as reduced cost, branding, and lastly, for university, we have partnership and collaboration opportunities and branding. So again, there's a lot of opportunities for you all to be involved. We're doing a lot of exciting work this year, and we're so glad to have you as part of the Capital Collab. So now I'll turn it over to Jeannie Cotaro. I'll take it, I'll take it back. Thank you, Rob. Um, and so what you're getting a sense of is, is again, that principle that we drive with, which is how can we scale change across the region in an equitable way? How do we keep all of these many stakeholders moving in the same direction? Um, which we get asked about a fair amount. Um, and I think that's a great question. You know, how do you actually, I mean, many universities and many of our employers are, are used to sort of being friendly competitors. And so how do you actually get them to engage all at the same, all at the same time moving in the same direction? What really excites me actually about this work and about the conversations that we have is that our employers and our universities are recognizing and deeply engaged in this value of collaboration because the need in our region is so great and the imperative for equitable outcomes is just so significant that all of our employers and all of our universities really do commit to working together in a way that um, I find quite inspiring. And so this means, for example, and I'm Ann Addison is on the phone, and so I'm going to um, pick on Northrop Grumman a little bit. One of my favorite conversations that I've had with leaders at Northrop Grumman is when we talk about that Northrop has been tremendously generous in offering internships to CoLab students. And, and so we have the conversation regularly to make sure that they're continuing to get value add for that program. And we say, what happens if CoLab students come into Northrop Grumman, have an internship, engage in an internship, um, but then they don't end up working there full time? What does, what, what's your take on that? And is that still a success for your, for, your, for your organization? And what they tell us always without fail is that we see this as a benefit to the entire ecosystem. And the reason that we do this work is because even if they're not eligible to be at Northrop Grumman today, or even if they don't come to work here today, um, we know that in 10 years, this might be the person that we hire. And so this is really the long game. And, and it's really about ensuring that we're developing an ecosystem where diverse talent in digital tech can thrive. So we today, I feel like I have to brag on our metrics just a little bit. I said that we, you know, we're aiming for this 45,000 number with at least 50% from underrepresented backgrounds. Our 2020 goal, because our universities are just getting up and running with the digital tech credential, our 2020 goal was to have 400 students engaged. We have 783. Starting in the fall, all of our K-12 jurisdictions are going to have their high school students enrolled in our aligned pathways. And so I, and that's hundreds of students from each K-12 jurisdiction. And so I really am quite confident as all of our institutions get up and running and as they're building multiple pathways, which I think is, is just incredible, we're going to really have a huge number of people in the marketplace with the digital tech skills that we know employers have said they need. So, um, 
with that, with the that last moment of of soapboxing from me, um, because I am I am so proud of the work that all of our partners are engaged in, and especially during this time um, where they haven't let a little thing like a global pandemic um, slow their work down because they feel the importance. It really has been an exciting time to be engaged with the collab. So I've seen a couple chats come in, a couple notes on the chat. Let me take a quick look. Um, Denise, we absolutely will add you to the Career Center group. That would be wonderful. Um, and actually, Deb, can I ask you to take this question um, on a little bit, a little bit more snapshot on student engagement, and then maybe Tasha, after Deb talks, you can talk a little bit about the ambassadors program and how we improve our engagement. Sure. I don't see the student engagement question. Can you direct me? Oh, it came to me directly. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you share more about, sorry, Denise, I'm I'm just, you know, sharing all of our private conversations. Can you share more about how many students have applied, received the badge, and have hired for internships and jobs through Collab? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the one of the things that we come up against is um, FERPA at each of the different universities. So um, we collect student information on our website, um, and then we have a monthly newsletter that Tasha can talk a little bit about. Um, we have Credential Month, we have Career Fair, we have all of this programming, and then the universities are really um, kind of tracking the the progress towards success. And then the universities will be the ones issuing the digital badge at the end, which is the signaling for employers. Um, but a lot of our, our programming and engagement um, is, is also just around getting the word out there about the credentials and the different offerings um, and opportunities that students have if they take this pathway. So we work very, very closely with all university um, partners and advising offices and career centers um, to make sure that we're closely aligned with getting the word out with students and balancing kind of this ownership of student information with, within the university and our student engagement. I hope that answers your question. I'll kick it over to Tasha too to, to add. Thanks, Deb. Um, yes, as far as the communications to students, the student newsletter is one of the ways that we get this message out to students about who we are um, in the collab specifically, but also lets them know about events that happens within the collab or with our partners. So each month, um, I compose and write um, what's going on with the collab or conduct interviews with our partners, so they get a feel of what the companies are doing and you know who's out there. Um, our ambassador program last year was the pilot for that program. It was super successful. We had seven ambassadors um, from uh, seven of our institutions here. And it's really through peer networking that they work together, um, kind of spreading the word about collab. And then also, um, they also are, they also get the opportunity to do this as well. So they're the first to know about what events are happening within the collab and then also the opportunities that exist. Thanks, Tasha. And we had a question come in from April. Is your curriculum all geared toward undergrads? Do you have anything for more advanced degrees, masters, et cetera, or any plans to add more advanced options? So there's a funny story about this, actually. And I hope I hope you appreciate it the way we do. Um, that is this program, the Digital Tech Credential Program, is really focused on shaping entry-level talent. And so when we pull together, as Lindsay's guiding the industry advisors in their development of those KSA lists, we really do focus them on what do people need in entry-level jobs in digital tech. Um, and that's because once they start getting into their roles and responsibilities, they get a lot of specific organization customization. Um, and we found that trying to engage really strongly in the upskilling space was actually duplicating a lot of efforts from other groups that are already out there. But here's Here's the funny part about all this. So we've always said that the digital tech credential is really for undergrads and we expect it to be sort of the traditional the traditional undergrad or, or people who maybe were working for a little bit and came back to finish their degree, right? Um, what's ended up happening is that students are students, right? And they do what they want. It turns out they don't always follow our instructions and all of, the, all of you who work with um, students know that that's exactly the way they are and bless them for that. So, so what we find is that despite our marketing and our communication around this being an entry level undergraduate program, the market signal that we're actually getting from our students is that they're using it for upskilling. And so we have graduate students that will take courses and treat this essentially as a micro credential, even though they already have an undergraduate degree, they'll go take a collection of courses that an institution has identified and they will then earn that digital badge and then HR systems at our at our organizations at our employer partners are learning to look for that digital badge and they'll know that person has the knowledge skills and abilities. So it's it's an interesting um, piece of the work that we're doing where it wasn't necessarily what we intended it for. 
Um, and what we're finding is that students are finding it quite useful for, for that micro-credentialing. So I actually expect that we're going to be seeing a bit more of that. The other piece that has been really terrific to see is just how many pathways some of our partners are beginning to map out. And so I know we have a couple of colleagues from University of Maryland on the phone. And University of Maryland is just a terrific example of this, where they're mapping five to 10 different pathways throughout a number of their schools, recognizing that students will need to learn data analytics and need to learn basic information security, the stuff that's tied with our generalist, generalist credential, for example, um, regardless of whether they are in a school of arts and sciences or in their iSchool. And so building out those multiple pathways ensures that a diversity of students are actually able to earn the digital tech credential. It's really incredible. Uh, and again, it is I think part and parcel with with our desire to always support the great work that everyone is doing and make sure that folks can really maximize what they're, where they're engaging and where they can excel. Um, and that's particularly true with our partners. I mean, we just, we just see some incredible moments where our partners say, I'm gonna do it this way and here's why it's gonna work. And then they blow it out of the water. And so we don't try to really over choreograph um, in terms of the implementation details because we don't wanna get in the way. Universities are very good educators. K-12 institutions are very good educators. Community colleges know how to educate their students. So we try not to tell our education partners how to educate. We give them the information they need from the employers so that they can make sure their curriculum is cutting edge in front of the pack and students are actually learning what employers need. And then, and then we just try to grease the wheels and keep things moving. So I see another question coming in. Is remote learning a newfound positive in reshaping core curriculum? Uh, Deb, do you want to take that one, given some of our partners at the table? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned earlier, so when we provide the KSAs, we really leave it up to the universities to math um, in the best way that fits their institution. Um, I'll give an example. The University System of Maryland is um, using CoLab as an effort to bring all of the institutions together. Um, and they are identifying areas of gaps in curriculum and creating edX modules, which will all be online, that will be offered to all University System of Maryland campuses to kind of augment their curriculum where they need it. So it's, it's a system-wide approach. It's using online learning. It has tremendous opportunity for scale um, across you know, multiple institutions. So it's a really exciting way that they are um, implementing. Um, VCU is another good example. All of their courses for their certificate that align to the credential are online. So I think a lot of institutions are being very creative about how they're, um, you know, either existing to current curriculum or even creating new opportunities, um, including online. Kelly, I want to make sure that we responded early in the early in the chat. You wanted to know more about digital badging, and I wanted to make sure, since we have some time, that we answered all of your questions on that front. Um, Tom on the phone has also been engaged in our digital badging efforts throughout throughout this process. Um, at this stage, despite his relative youth, he's practically the grandfather of the collab. He's one of our original staff members. He and Lindsay, um, so he can also answer some questions there. Do you have any, do we need to go deeper on that one for you, Kelly? I see you unmuting. I see it's coming. I know it's the worst when your mouse freezes and you can't get it unmuted. Where's like my mind? Yes. Right. Thanks, Tina. I'm, I'm good. I think you covered what I needed to hear at this point. There's a team of us from the University of Maryland. They're going to be trying to take this to the next step. And I just want to make sure that uh, We've got as much detail as we can get, but this was helpful. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you. And again, I, you know, we like to pick on our partners um, by calling them out for doing good works. And so University of Maryland was one of those institutions where our executive leadership was just very, very strong. So President Pines there sent a note to his team and said, it's time to get going. And we want to, we really want to double down on CoLab, which was just incredible. And now every, the whole, the whole team at University of Maryland is really, I think, engaging in tremendously um, creative ways and entrepreneurial ways to think about how we can better serve students and especially diverse students. So it's been just, just really exciting um, to see. So let's see. We have, we have a little more time for questions. If we have any other, any other questions comments 
rave reviews for CoLab 101, best class you've ever taken. We hear it all the time. Yeah, thanks, Ken. You're an easy audience. If I can add, while well, people are thinking of any other questions, just another note on the digital badges for any employers who are on the call. I think one thing we were really mindful of as we were thinking about this, the diversity of the digital tech credential curriculum and how it's being implemented is that we want to make sure it's as clear as possible for you all when you're receiving applications in that someone has this curriculum and the digital tech credential via the badge. Um, was the way that we landed on to standardize all of these different pathways that exist across institutions. Um, and we're really, we're working with folks in real time to make sure that that's still the most effective way. And the talent acquisition working group is the best way to get really tactical and provide feedback on that process. Um, and then Deb's work with the academic institutions is the best way to think through from an education side um, the implications that the badge would have on curriculum and, and sharing for students. Deb, do you want to take that question from Denise about the separate badging platforms? Because that's that's a great question and has been actually core to our strategy on badging. Yeah, so as we got started, um, we decided to go with a Credly contract. Um, we quickly realized with the variety of institutions we had at the table, many had their own badging efforts or were looking into their own badging efforts. So we um, we only have Credly institutions right now, but are very willing to work with other platforms. Um, I know UMGC has um, Parchment as their platform. So we're looking into you know how we can integrate that as well. And just to kind of build off that, uh, in terms of badges, we are we are basically trying to ensure that we're supporting the open badge standard ecosystem. So any badges that align with the IMS global open badge standards is, um, you know, we're flexible with, with those. Now I'll drop a link to that for folks that aren't as familiar. Okay, so let's see, we can, anyone not go through continuing ed? So, so, so far, all of our programs are in four credit sides of the house. So uh, that's, that's how our university partners have been using them and how our K-12 pathways work is also mapping. So it's all in four credit sides of the house. Um, you know, could, could that shift in the future? I think it probably could because our employers ultimately are interested in skills-based hiring. I mean, that's really what is the core to the collab is making sure that we are just crystal clear on what's needed in the workforce around all of these digital tech roles and ensuring that people can then get access to those skills. So one of the one of the elements that we've seen, to be perfectly honest, is that um, we have plenty of third party vendors out there and we don't keep our KSAs a secret. Um, and so the employer signaling system website is up and you can see the KSAs that are on the employer signaling system. When you look at that, um, you know, you can you can see and align your curriculum potentially to that. And that is certainly something um, that we know a number of third party vendors that are offering not for credit tracks actually are looking at. Now, I will say we are officially partners with post-secondary institutions that offer credit. So just just know that. But we don't keep them a secret. And so I do expect that we'll see an increasing number of these not for credit uh, groups potentially say that they're aligning their curriculum to our knowledge, skills, and abilities on the employer signaling system. Thank you, Tom, for putting the employer signaling system in the chat. Here's what I'm going to ask the team to do is, uh, you can see we have an email address down there. It's so small that you probably can't read it, um, but you are welcome to email us at collab at greaterwashingtonpartnership.com. I'm also going to ask the team to drop their email addresses just into the chat. So if there's anyone specifically that you wanna reach out to, uh, you certainly can feel free to reach out to them. But if you do email that collab, at greaterwashingtonpartnership.com email address. We certainly will make sure that the email gets to one of us. Um, we are really grateful that you spent some time with us today. Really enjoyed it. And um, you know, welcome, welcome your questions, welcome your comments, welcome your aha moments as you are thinking about your Collab 101 experience in the middle of the night happens more often than you would think. Like Jeannie, I just realized that I had this thought about this thing and I, you know, Sometimes I'm awake and I'll even answer. So please go ahead and um, I'll get my email address in here as well. 
And feel free to follow up with any of us. We are, again, just very, very happy that you are here today and um, that you wanted to learn a little bit more about our work. We're pretty, we're pretty happy with what we do and pretty excited about the potential to really change the region um, and are delighted that you're interested in potentially being a part of it or at least just learning more. Um, Lindsay's usually the best typist in the group. So that's funny that she's messing up her email address. That's not her normal style. It's usually me that messes up the email address. All right, folks. Well, with that, um, we will definitely send out the presentation to everyone who was on this webinar so that you have it and so that you can read the type that was so tiny that you couldn't possibly see it. So we will send that out to you immediately following this event. And again, thank you for your time. Have a wonderful afternoon. We look forward to the next one.